Welcome to the 2024 Humanities Podcasting Symposium. In order to keep the focus on the panelists, we ask that everyone not presenting, please mute their mics and their videos. This will allow us to focus on the panelists now and in the subsequent video recording. Please note that we are recording this session and intend to post it on YouTube after the symposium. You're welcome to participate in the chat throughout the session. And when it comes to the Q&A, everyone can turn their cameras on if they wish and we will all be a round table. So I'm gonna introduce our four panelists for this session. So first of all, Cecilia Gelotti is a self-taught podcaster and second generation college radio host who has never recorded in the same room with a co-host or guest. Her preferred subject is music of all kinds and her preferred format is chat show style though she's making an effort to broaden her palette on both fronts. She is an American living in Germany. Sadia Khan is an immigrant, rights activist, social entrepreneur, mom, and ardent coffee drinker. She's the founder of Immigrantly Media, a digital storytelling startup that amplifies the authentic narratives of over 70 million first and second generation immigrants in the US. Driven by a mission to transform how immigrant stories are told, she uses her background in human rights advocacy and digital content creation to produce podcasts that acknowledge and celebrate nuanced, diverse perspectives. Currently, Immigrantly Media has five unique podcasts and more in development. Linda Mora is a professor of English and the writer, host, and co-producer of Getting Lit with Linda, which won in the category of Outstanding Education Series at the fifth annual Canadian Podcast Awards in 2022 and in the category of education for the Women in Podcasting Awards in 2024. The podcast, now in its fifth year, invites people to learn about and to love literature in Canada, one book at a time. Each episode offers insights about the book and how these insights apply to our daily lives. Marco Timpano is a multi-award winning podcaster, actor, author, and voiceover artist. His expertise in podcasting has been recognized by the Globe and Mail, CTV Morning Live, and Sirius XM, author of 25 Things I Wish I Knew Before I Started My Podcast, Marco helps aspiring podcasters navigate the industry with insightful advice and teaches podcast fundamentals at George Brown College in Toronto. So the title of our session is Best Practices for, um, what's the other thing? for Connecting with New Guests and Audiences. So to get us started, I wanted to ask each of our panelists, what is something surprising or counterintuitive that you do to connect with new guests or audiences? So who would like to get us started? Uh, I'll start. <laughs> so, um... I should say, first of all, that just being on a podcast initially was a real challenge. Just hosting one, working collaboratively with others in that kind of forum was a challenge in and of itself. And it's no small credit to Marco, who's helped me co-produce, produce Getting Lit with Linda, um, that I've actually gotten to the place where I now routinely speak with authors over the um, in a podcast format. So... Um, one of the things that I think that I have found challenging is trying to make my guests feel comfortable when I myself feel anxious and uncomfortable. So it's trying to find that way of connecting with them so that we both forget that this is actually being recorded. So um, some of the strategies that I use it from the very outset is, uh, or one strategy that I use is I start recording before we actually start recording, if you know what I mean. That is, I start the recording and we're still talking. We're not at the point where we're conducting the more formal interview. And once that happens, they we kind of slip into the interview and then they forget. So it's just kind of streaming them into that process of being interviewed before they even know what's happening. One, that's one tactic. Well, one strategy that I use with my guests is when I ask a question, uh, I can see on their faces uh, when they need a moment, much like what, when Milan asked the question off the top, we all took a moment to, to, to think about the question before we answered it. When I see that my guest has that moment of like, oh, I need a second, 
I'll often share my story based on the question I asked, which affords my guests to formulate how they are going to respond and also hear what kind of response that um, my listeners might expect. So they might think, oh, I need to be very robust in this answer, but rather when I share my story or my interpretation of that question, um, it often, I can see it eases them in and then they're able to respond. And generally speaking, they'll respond uh, with a great deal of enthusiasm. So that's one tip that I would, I would certainly share. Um, for me, for my guests, and we have five podcasts, so I, I'm, talk, I'm going to talk about immigrantly that I host. Um, I do a lot of research on whoever comes on board, and I try to ask them questions that have not been asked before. And this may seem weird, but it really works because if you if you listen to them on all different podcasts and read their articles, there's always something that they've not been asked. That's one. And two, I don't lose eye contact. So my biggest thing is to just look at them and make sure that they know that I'm listening and that I am paying attention. Um, and sometimes I'll repeat what they said so that they know that I, I am listening. So that's something that I, I make sure that they are very comfortable and that they know that I am listening to what they're saying. I love these video-based responses so far. I'm the one based in Germany, as you might be able to tell from the lighting here. <laughs> it's after 9 p.m. where I am. And the software that I have used in my podcasting experience thus far has been much more successful without video function as opposed to with it. So whether I'm conversing with my co-host or with a guest, it's been essentially a phone conversation. So I haven't been able to rely on visual cues, have not been able to sort of judge where they're at or how they're feeling or maybe gauge what their response might be by any kind of visual signal. So I treat it like a phone conversation. I treat it as something as it, I think people are drawn to podcasts for their intimacy. And I think I'm then forced to act with more intimacy or to embrace an intimacy that I might not otherwise be inclined to because it would feel more like a performance or I'm sort of in a performance mind space or head space. But it's, it's sort of a philosophy of no, just treat it as if you're talking to a friend and trust that the genuineness of that conversation will translate to an audience. Could be That's a, great. A, yeah. I feel like I still want to say more. <laughs> Can I? Yeah. More? <laughs> Give us more tips. Give us more strategies. Um, so I'm also coming from the uh, from the point of view as an academic, and so many of the presentations I were I was listening to in the earlier panels, we ha we have academics who are coming to the podcasting forum, and so one of the um, issues or challenges for an academic is to translate the material for audiences. Who are not academic, and so when I've uh, one of the benefits of teaming up with Marco is that Marco will often listen to my episodes and say, "Linda, no one's going to know what that word is. That's specialized language," and so I don't change the interviews at that point when I've forgotten. But what I then do is include either in my show notes or in the introductory piece to the interview, I comment on that particular word or phrase or idiom and I unpack it so that my uh, my listeners are prepared for what's to follow. And just touching upon that that actual comment there, I try to, when I'm on the podcast, on my podcast uh, speaking, I try to think with international ears. In other words, would uh, someone listening in, let's say, Germany understand what I'm talking about, or someone in Bahrain where I have listeners, would they understand that? And because I'm a Canadian podcaster, sometimes I'll use Canadianisms in there, right? And I don't, I certainly don't censor myself uh, to try to have a more standard language of English, but rather I, I lean into that aspect of me and because I think it's important for myself as a Canadian podcaster to be in the landscape and share my stories. But then I try to define in the moment what that word is, or if my guests should say something like a double double, I'll explain that is how we take our coffee up here with two creams and two sugars, right? And and then once you dis once you're able to define those moments, the listener doesn't get distracted by them. And I find that if if you have a lot of these um, terms that that listener might not be aware of, they start to think, what, what is that? What is that? And they're not listening forward. So that's another strategy that I would share is like, when you hear them, 
or if your guests should say them, I always have, one of the tips I have is I always have envelopes in front of me and I'll always be writing the envelopes because they're the perfect size, right? Uh, so when you, know, you get your bills, I keep the envelopes. And if my guests should say something that I feel needs a further definition, I'll write it down in the moment and when they're done their thought, I might say, I just wanna circle back to what you said earlier and just uh, can, we, can, we, can we define that or can you, can you explain that to me? You know, this is this is such an interesting conversation, and it also, I think, probably predicates on who you are and what your background is. Um, because I am an immigrant, and I grew up in a different country, and then I moved to the US, and I am in a way navigating different cultures already, and I speak multiple languages. Um, when I think of my audience, it's more like, I don't think at such a granular level and, and that's probably because where i'm coming from right because i my background lends itself to be more i guess international in some ways to your point marco and for me it's almost as if when i'm conversing with somebody else whether it's a guest or thinking about my listeners i'm almost approaching it from a place of curiosity more so than informational piece, right? So it's like, oh, I'm curious to know what they think. Or if I say something, I'm hoping that listeners, it piques their curiosity and they go and maybe Google it or look it up or try to understand it on their own. Um, so that's fascinating to me how, how you guys are defining it and how I approach the, the same, um, I guess, piece of podcasting. If I can add, I think a commonality that I'm sensing among all of these approaches is the openness factor in terms of welcoming the audience in, including the audience. So it's defining things that might not be obvious or might not be self self evident, I guess, and also sustaining that curiosity, extending that curiosity to the guests, which then translates to the audience as far as doing their own research, educating themselves on something that they are more interested to know about. Um, and I think that all of those, my co-host, who is also my dad, who is the first generation of the college radio host, and I are both, I, he's, he's an academic, uh, he does his college radio show at the university where he teaches uh, literature. Uh, and then I, while I'm not actively an academic right now with connected with an institution um, continue to write papers and and participate in the scholarly world and I think that that is a balance that we're always trying to strike as far as we're discussing music we're looking at it from the close reading lens of an academic in the literature field and the humanities field and we're also trying to speak directly to audiences um, in a way that might either satisfy their existing curiosity for the material or awaken in them a curiosity that they might not hitherto have known. I mean, so yeah, all of these points about language use and, and uh, they make sense because I think as people that identify with the humanities, I think we all have an interest in, you know, language, speech, words. Um, I'm curious um, what you all do that are sort of non-verbal or non-linguistic strategies for connecting with guests or connecting with audiences, right? Like what are the things that go beyond language or are not about language? Um, does anything come to mind for any of you? We had eye contact already, but so let's, what, are, what other things can we put on the table? I think there's a power in silence sometimes, in particular in this uh, yeah. in this medium, and I feel like uh, sometimes, and I've seen, I've actually heard Linda do this very well, where a guest is is answering a question, but they're very short with it, and Linda will just do this or say go on, and the guest continues. It's sort of this permission. And what's lovely about podcasting is, you know, it's primarily a medium for listeners, right? And so. Your listeners don't necessarily see what's going on in the booth or in front of you, right? So I will often write things down if I hear some, a guest say something that I want to touch upon later, or I'll have hand signals with my co-host so we know when I need to do something technical, I'll just do this, and they'll and they'll know that they need to fill in that space, right? So using those those forms of communication which are nonverbal can can often be uh, a source of of help for the podcast. That's that's what I found. 
from sort of the promotional cool. perspective, um, to, to change gears for a minute, I'll say that I've had a tremendous amount of fun in the two seasons of my podcast thus far, envisioning ideas for what the cover photo, the poster, if you will, of the podcast will look like. And I commissioned an artist friend of mine from college, actually, to create the two covers that exist for the two seasons thus far, which are obvious sort of send, not send ups, but takes on the album, the covers of the albums that we're discussing in each, each season. And so it's an homage. It's something that people, that might be a hint to people who know what the music is or who recognize kind of, oh, that this is the album that they must be discussing. And it's sort of a fun clue, if you will, for people who aren't as well versed in those albums. So that has been uh, a, a, a visual component that I'm looking forward to exploring more as the project goes on. Yeah, I want to go back to Marco's point about silence. I think that's such an um, underestimated power in podcasting. People don't realize the power of silence when you are having a conversation and then you have that moment of pause as you're internalizing that conversation. Um, for immigrantly, especially at the end of each episode, I ask my guests to define the US, the United States of America. And it's a very simple question, but it's it's funny how many people pause and they're like, oh my gosh, I never thought of it. And that pause and that silence for them to ruminate over it and then answer, I we always make sure that that's left in because it's really um, emblematic of how they're in real time struggling with that question and how they are trying to put their thoughts together. And that really adds to the overall conversation, especially around this question. So silence sometimes really speaks volumes. I'm sorry, I just have to say a simple question. That's an enormous question. If you were to ask me that question, I would pause for days. <laughs> and, and a brilliant question too. I think that's a wonderful note on which to end an episode. Thank you. Marco, you need to unmute. You're on mute. I just like to move my hands around every once in a while. I was I was just saying that there's, <laughs> a, lot of, there's a lot of emotion in uh, those moments of silence, right? And I can always tell a no novice podcaster will will trim out those moments of silence. So it's like question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. And it becomes very repetitive and predictable. And uh, podcasts are one of the beauty of podcasts is they are unpredictable. And when you have that emotion, even that that gasp before they answer, you realize the weight of the question that was asked. So, you know, I, I concur with that. There's a lot in that sign. So it speaks volumes, as you said. Yes. I think what I would add to these, these are wonderful responses. I would concur with everything that's been said so far. I think what I would add to this is um, what uh, what Sadia had said earlier, which is that you really want to deeply listen to the people who are possibly on a video call with you. In Cecilia's case, this is not so, but it is for me. And so often what I'm doing is leaning forward and really listening and not being caught up with the questions that I have on the sheet in front of me, right? So it's important to have that script for sure but not being so absorbed by that script that I'm forgetting the person sitting across from me and really engaging them in a deep converse and meaningful conversation. I think also something that, that I'm realizing I do, just speaking of silence, like nonverbal affirmations as people are speaking, we cut almost all of them out in the edit. And especially when you're recording virtually, you know, those are two separate audio tracks. They can be cut completely, but I'm doing a lot of, mm, mm hmm oh, okay. Like constantly, it doesn't really work for a podcast listener, but for the guests, I think it really helps them to feel listened to and encouraged. And, uh, you know, I that then becomes- I don't always cut those out. I don't always oh, yeah? cut those out. No, no, I leave, I take out maybe a few, but I leave some of them in because it creates a kind of, um dynamic that i mm. that i can't uh, there perfect there you go. <laughs> it creates a kind of dynamic that i actually think is quite lovely i think it's good to have those moments in there not too many i uh, i agree with linda because for me um, and i do that a lot hmm's has my reactions are sometimes like i mean even if i'm surprised or i'm shocked or whatever 
And as an avid podcast listener, because all of us are consumers of podcasts as well, something that it's it's extremely important to talk about. Like I consume podcasts. I don't know how many podcasts I listen to in a week. Um, I find it more intimate. I find it more casual. I find it more personal because that's how all of us speak. Um, and so for me, it's also important. I'll take a few out because they can get a bit like nerve wracking because we say them more than we should. Uh, but then there are some strategic ones um, that I leave. And going back to Linda's point about script, there have been instances where I will have a few questions and I hardly use them because my guest takes me somewhere completely different. And allowing yourself and giving yourself the permission to go where your guest wants to go or where they take you is such a beautiful journey, um, something that I've noticed. Um, sometimes people are so hung up on those five, six questions uh, that wherever the guest is going and whatever the follow up could be, they go back to those questions and you can see that disruption and that disjointed conversation. Um, so it's really important to just let the conversation flow organically. And just to add to that, I think it shows your guest uh, the ultimate respect if you don't get tied to questions you've written. Because when you're able to ask a question in the moment, it demonstrates to your guest and your audience that you've been listening to your guest and what they've said. Rather than, I have a laundry list here and I'm just going to go through the laundry list, check, check, I've asked that, check, 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 right? Nobody wants that. And just to add on that, I would also, I would also recommend that you know, your audience doesn't want to be read to. And I think that's another uh, error that a lot of novice uh, podcasters make. If they want to be read to, they'll listen to an audiobook. And that's where you're like, okay, I'm going to listen to an audiobook. This person's going to read to me. Great. I'm going to listen and sit back. But rather than get tied on the content that you want to make so eloquent and perfect, the sound of someone reading and not able to lift those words from the page can get very monotonous and your listener can tell right away. So my suggestion is always, if you can't make those words come off the page to seem natural, just write down the points you want to say and talk to the points. And I find that's very effective. And if you have a guest in particular, it won't seem like you're doing this, but rather engaging. I As mean, a podcast think it... listener, I'll sort of, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'll just sort of build on what's already been said. Uh, and I will say that this goes more for kind of strictly journalism and news-based podcasts, but I can't count the number of times that I've heard an interviewee leave off on such a juicy point and then the journalist the reporter just moves on to their next question and sort of kills the mood as it as it were that the interviewee was was setting up with what they were saying and starts from scratch and it just drives me crazy i think why are you, why are you not just allowing this conversation to go where it's already naturally going why not be organic and sort of go with the flow? But then to do that, especially as sort of the, the captain of the ship, as you will, is extremely difficult. So my great respect to everyone who can. I mean, I think it's revealing that all of you in our discussion before this session prefer to have a conversation like we're having now than to do scripted presentations, right? Like that was an option and other people in other panels have chosen to do that and that's fine. But this is a group of people that really wanted to have that format for this as well as for the podcast that you all make. So yeah, I think this is sort of, um, you're all on the same page there, which, which is nice. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of, kind of pick up on a few threads um, that I think connect up about the idea of sort of the value of thinking out loud, right? And to me, that feels like that might be one of the kind of core things that a humanities podcast can do, right? Like it's different from a journalistic interview. It's different from a humanities lecture or an academic book in the humanities. Um, but there's something about thinking out loud that, um, you know, whether it's the long pause between a difficult question and, and a complex answer, um, or, you know, a guest that leaves something hanging in the air and then the host of the podcast picks it up and takes it somewhere new, um, that that feels like it is a powerful way to certainly connect with a guest in the moment, but also maybe to connect with audiences who are listening and can kind of 
they're also thinking out loud, or at least they're following along the train of thought in a, in a way. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to invite anyone to respond, you know, what does thinking out loud mean to you? Is that something that you kind of consciously strive for? Do you feel like it helps you make those connections? Yes, I certainly think so. I think um, it's important to me in that process to, to think out loud because it is a way of my connecting with that person who's sitting across the, in, the interview booth with me or across a video call with me. Um, but it, it also helps me to think about how laterally, how I'm also connecting with the listeners, not just with the person who's sitting across from me. So often when I'm thinking, I'm thinking about, not only what I want to know, but what my audience may want to know. So there's always that kind of that balancing act that is um, implicit in this kind of conversation. I think when I think of thinking out loud, one of the things that initially I was hesitant to do was like expose myself to that kind of vulnerability, right? Because when you are thinking out loud, sometimes you're like, oh, do I, do I sound smart enough? Do I sound articulate? Do I sound whatever people I want people for me, like I want people to think about myself. And I think we have to suspend those, I don't want to call them insecurities, but those thoughts and say, look, this is who I am. It's a human to human conversation. And if I can, you know, form a sentence and articulate my thoughts in a certain way, and if they are authentic on original, they will resonate with audiences, they will resonate with guests. And I don't have to overthink how I sound. And I think that was something that it took me a while. And then I was like, and I don't want to curse here, but I was like, yeah, let's just get over that, whatever inertia it is, and just be myself and not worry about what people would think. Yes, to, to both of the points that have just been made, there have been a couple of times uh, in my recording experience where I've said something, and this is in the course of maybe analyzing a song, and I've said something, and I know it's counterintuitive to say, particularly in a humanities and arts environment, that an interpretation is wrong, but I'll say something, and then out loud, it just sounds off base, or it doesn't sound right, and again, my first impulse is to panic and say, oh no, what, what will the listeners think of me, but I think that that is a strength to be able, a, 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 a means of connecting with the audience and with your fellow, with your guests or your co-host or whoever happens to be in the studio, uh, re, uh, physical or proverbial <laughs> with you. Um, and to hear an opinion being formed, to hear a mind being changed in real time is something that we don't get a lot of access to in kind of an ultra curated media world. So to be able to have those moments, I think is one of the things, and then for the creators to be able to be vulnerable in that way and to be emotionally honest with themselves and with their listeners is one of the things that I think makes podcasts so special as a genre. Just to add on what everyone said, one of the first things I uh, tell my students of podcasting is that uh, pod podcasting is the perfect imperfect medium um, and uh, listeners really enjoy hearing that you are it's not perfect they're not watching a newscast or listening to the radio and uh, you know like an interview on on a, on a radio station they want to hear the humanity from from the listener and I, i'll say this and my background is uh performance and improv and we always look at you know mistakes or errors as a gift right and i can't tell you how many times i've said something that was incorrect or i made an assumption and said it on the air or on my podcast i should say and the reaction that i get from my listeners creates this gift of engagement that wouldn't be there if i didn't make that mistake so what will happen is i'll say something it'll be incorrect and let me tell you i say a lot of things that people that people should when they listen to my podcast should not take as you know uh, anything but my thoughts and I will get reactions from listeners and they'll have a ball or they'll say you know we have that here too you're not the only one or whatnot right I'm thinking of an episode where I talked about bags of milk and how I assumed that only Canada had bags of milk and I heard from everywhere Argentina we have bags of milk I can't believe you said that blah 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 and then I had to reach and for 
four episodes, I had to deal with my bag of milk mistake, and it was wonderful, right? And we, it, it caused my guests to have a lot of laughter and fun and whatnot. And if I do make a, a mistake that is more um, potent, I'll come back on the next episode and say, I just want to clear the air. I said this, what I meant was this, or I realized it was this. And it adds this element of humanity to the podcast and the listeners, I find, engage with that much more. That's been my experience. Yeah, I love hearing this. And it's making me realize it's something that I do and I haven't even been that conscious of it um, as a host is um, I, I make deliberately stupid analogies, um, right? Like, you know, a guest will be saying something very dense and academic and theoretical, and then I'll sort of find a moment to interrupt and say like, okay, so is it like when you're like walking in the rain and you step in a puddle and then like your trousers are wet for the rest of the day or you know I, like, I'm just making this up but the point is like I try to like draw on something from sort of everyday life not something academic not something that is sort of exclusive knowledge and the point is that it is like a very simplistic uh yeah oversimplification of the ideas but then it allows the guest to say well, sort of, but here, let me add a little bit more nuance and we sort of meet halfway and hopefully it's then a bit more accessible to a listener that I've sort of brought the tone way down and then the guests can bring it up a little. Um, and, okay, and this is a transition to another kind of area. I pre-plan some of those analogies. So even before the, uh, the conversation, I tried to think like, okay, what are some really stupid analogies that I might want to like pull out during the conversation, which leads me to my next question for you all, which is, we've talked a lot about kind of uh, interacting with guests in the moment during the recording, and how that might also create connections with audiences later on. What about that kind of preparation phase before, you know, before you're recording with the guest, maybe you're emailing with them, maybe you have a preliminary conversation. Linda, you also talked about the sort of hitting record way before the episode begins, but just what are some best practices that you all can think of about connecting with guests before the recording begins? So for me, as I said, I do a lot of research and I also, if those, if any of my guests, which most of them are, if they've been on a podcast, I listen to the, the podcast they've been on and their voice. It shows me how they communicate, how the voice modulates. It just tells me, um, how I can make them comfortable. I don't know why, it's just this intuition for me to see, okay, this is how they speak and this is how I can make them comfortable. And that's something that I do because I feel like when we ask somebody to come and be part of our platform, then we should give them respect to do enough research and get to know them enough so that we can have a robust conversation uh, because I've been on podcasts where it's like, okay, these are the six questions I'm going to ask you. I don't care who you are, where you're coming from. These are the questions and then we're done. And I kid you not, that's not a good experience. It's not because then you don't, you don't feel the connection. You don't feel like you're sitting with, because if you think of podcasting, it is such an intimate medium, right? It's supposed to be a conversation with a friend or somebody that you know or want to know. Um, so that's something that I do, and I'm really intentional about that. I'll often connect with my uh, guests to let them know the time frame for which we record. And um, I'll let them know the best, if they're not in studio with me, be the best equipment to have or not have when they're on the podcast. I, I, I'm not a big fan of earbuds with the microphone there because they rattle on clothes when I have a guest. So I kind of explain that to them if they have like closed headphones are best. Um, if I'm able to provide it for them, I will. Um, then another thing I'll say is, you know, I'll, I'll often say if, and my, my podcast can afford this. If there's anything said in the podcast and you think, oh, I don't want that in, just let me know and I'll edit it out. And that often will give them sort of a safety to be like, okay, I'll talk freely. And if there's something later on, and I've only had once a guest ask me to remove something from the, from the podcast interview. Uh, so that's another thing that I will do. And uh, much like Linda, I'll always start with an easy question for the uh, guest to answer that has nothing to do with the content that we're going to do. So the first question I'll, and I'll say, I'm just checking levels and I'll say, what did you have for breakfast today? And it's something that anyone can answer. And as they're answering, I might ask more questions and they'll, I can see them starting to feel comfortable because 
they'll walk in a little bit nervous. They'll have a microphone in front of them. They'll be like, okay, what am I going to do? And I try to take all that off their plate. So I'm like, don't worry. I'll look at the tech. You don't have to touch anything. You don't have to just say anything. You just have to be present. And I'll start with asking a very simple question like that so that they feel comfortable. I've tried to, treat, I've tried to treat the collaborators that I've had thus far, just sort of like friends I haven't met yet, as far as talking to them like over Instagram or something about, you know, planning, planning everything, but then also talking about things that have nothing to do with the podcast even <laughs> and just getting to know them better and connecting on social media is a great way to get a better sense of them as a person and the other things that they're interested in that they care about, um, their other areas of expertise, et cetera. Um, because that makes for a more well-rounded discussion and a more enjoyable discussion, frankly. Yes, I've agreed with everything that's said thus far. I would say um, that one of the best ways to prepare your guests is not to prepare them. That's the way that I would say it. That is, you don't want to give them the questions in advance and you don't want to give them too much information. And it's not because you want them to mess up. It's because you don't want them to over script how they're going to answer. You won't get the vulnerable, meaningful answers that will come out of a really good and productive connection and conversation. So um, when I prepare them, I only prepare them in terms of the tech. And because I'm interviewing people about the books they've written, I always tell them, you're already the expert. You're coming on the podcast in this episode to share your expertise. There's nothing you need to do to prepare except know the about elements of tech. That's it. Um, that said, I should say I have two types of episodes. So one is interviewing authors and the other is just a, a type where I talk about an author's book and riff on an idea. And when I'm doing that, then really the connection is only with the audience and not with the person with whom I'm having a conversation. And in that case, Marco actually taught me this, and that is to look at my analytics and have a look at who's been paying attention to particular episodes, who do I think the audience will be, and what kinds of things can I heighten in that particular episode to better connect with the potential listeners. Can you say a little bit more about like what, what that means concretely? Like what, what do these analytics tell you? I genuinely, I haven't sure. used this before. So yeah, like yeah. what, what you... can you know? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I have my, this particular podcast on ACAST. And so I can see where people are coming from, what country and so forth. And it, and more specifically what state. Um, and so I had done this episode on uh, a playwright who is no longer with us, Lorena Gale. The name of the play is Je me souviens which means I remember. Um, it's based on a, on the um, the license plates. I actually have it handy. Mm -hmm. Quebec license plates. Uh, it's based on the license plates of Quebec, but it was preceded uh, or it came after this uh, license plate called La Belle Province. Um, and so that was what the license plate in Quebec used to look like. And I was explaining why she was using Je me souviens and the license plate and so forth. And then I began to reference the captions on license plates in states where I knew I had listeners so that they would be integrated or feel like they were recognized and seen as part of the episode. I'll just jump off from there. What I, what I will always tell people with regards to analytics is look at the analytics and how they speak to you and your podcast is how you should use them. So Linda's giving a great example of how um, Linda's able to look at the podcast, her podcast and see how she can use the analytics uh, to, to benefit her listeners and, and her podcast. I always say, look at the, look at the analytics. If that works for you, if you're not a person, you're like, I don't know, analytics scare me, then don't worry about that. But look at what the analytics say to you and what you find interesting and lean into that. And the things that you don't find interesting or the things that you don't quite understand, lean away from that, but lean into what, what works for you. And I've done that on my podcast too. I'm I'm a traveler. I enjoy traveling, and I'll look at the different countries. And sometimes I'll use uh, the country as a jumping-off point for the theme of the episode, where I have know I have listeners. I find those takes really helpful as someone who is still getting comfortable with analytics. I would say, and with interpreting or analyzing analytics, if you will. And I'm thinking, all right, it's great to see you know this international representation. These I don't know 
age groups uh, in, in different different demographics, but what do they mean? What should they mean, if anything? What would be most fruitful or helpful for me to take from them? And I have to say that I, I am still grappling with that. I don't know that I have come to terms exactly with how I feel about using analytics or allowing them to inform uh, the work, the podcast, the project itself. So I will absolutely keep those interpolations in mind. I'd like to also add this. Do not worry about how many listeners you have in your first season of podcasting, because that number will change the more episodes you have and the more seasons or the longer you do it. So I find that a lot of podcasters, when they begin, they are solely focused on that analytic. I've only got 300 listeners. I've only got 25 listeners. And I'm always like, don't look at that. Don't look at that for the first season or two. Don't worry about that because when you first launch your first episode, you might only have 25 listeners, 20 of whom you know very well, but that same episode will acquire listeners later on in season two, more people will listen. So that episode that only has 25 listeners today will have 250, 2000, or maybe 30. And it's all right because your story is out there. Your, uh, your, your voice is being heard. Yeah, I mean, in the spirit of responding to what's just been said, um, that's fascinating because it, it makes me think about like, you know, we think about connecting with audiences and we probably think about that happening at the moment that we release an episode, right? Like that's the moment that we think we're connecting with audiences. But what you're saying, Marco, is also that, you know, years down the line, something that we did years ago and we've already forgotten about can be making new connections with new audiences. Um, does anyone else have experience of that, of a sort of big time lag and finding people still connecting with, with your podcast? Yeah, so we have a catalog of like, because we have five podcasts and Immigrantly is the oldest, we have a catalog of like 200 something episodes just for Immigrantly. And I, looking at analytics, something that I do a lot, uh, <laughs> I'm someone, someone who just wants to understand numbers and, you know, consumption percentages and all of that. Um, a, an episode from two years ago is still being listened to, to what Marco said, because you have it in your catalog and somebody will resonate with it. Maybe the topic, the title, the, the description, the content itself. So whatever you create, it, it exists in that ecosystem and people have access to it. So that's something important. But to what Marco said um, about how people are hung up on numbers and downloads and i'm really curious to hear everybody's thoughts here i feel like a lot of podcasters and creatives in this ecosystem are hung up because especially those who are trying to monetize podcasts or trying to make, make themselves sustaining is that it's like almost like it's something that we it's a necessary imperative in in a way right you have to you have to we hear this so often so how do get over that right and how do we say look we get it's important but then we need to focus on what really matches which is connection and good content but i think it's like almost counterintuitive because you want to keep producing that content right i almost feel like marco you have to answer this. <laughs> I, I think marco should answer this because in the insomnia project you've got um you you do have monetization, but you're also mindful of your listeners and how their needs are more important than the advertising that that uh, I'll let you tell that story. Yeah, I'll just say this. And uh, I'm, I'm curious to know from the, from the panelists here, you know, it, it always surprises me the episodes that listeners will gravitate to. I never think it's like that. I didn't think that was a great episode at all. And everyone's like, all on it and so um my podcast is called the insomnia project which is one of the podcasts i do and it's meant for people who cannot sleep and so my thing is this one of the things i love about podcasting is that you know you you are in complete control unless you're someone's paying you to do a podcast you can deliver whatever you as the artist or the creator wants to deliver so i always for me i think what what would I want to hear? What do I want to present? And if I was a listener of my podcast, what would I want? And I start there. And so I'm very conscious, like my podcast is meant to make you fall asleep. So I try to 
bring the most boring topics I can to make you uh, not worry about it and just listen to me talk about stamps for 26 minutes. And, you know, but there'll always be someone who's excited about stamps and they'll be like, I couldn't listen to your stamp episode because I love stamps. And I'm like, okay, but for every one person who loves stamps, there's a thousand people who find stamps not so exciting and they'll fall asleep. So I don't worry about my numbers. I really don't. And what's funny is that the less I worried about my numbers, the more my numbers went up. And so now I have like a great deal of listeners. And what's interesting is if I miss an app, if I miss a week, I will hear from my from my listeners, hey, is everything all right? What's going on? We missed you last week, uh, you know, and whatnot. So it, it's also that connection that you can make on other platforms, so social media or however they reach out to you, however you say, you know, to connect with your listeners. And I think that's another key thing. Have a medium other than just the podcast for your listeners to connect with you. I don't know if I answered that question properly. Cecilia, I feel like you got cut off, so I'm going to throw it to you, which you're on this side of my screen here. So I'm going to throw it to you. No, I, I, I love that. And I, when you mentioned stamps, I thought, oh, I know many people who would not get a wink that night. <laughs> um, I think stamps really, I don't know, really awaken something in people. Um, and I personally think they're fascinating. So that is, ask, is maybe one that I would skip out on. Let me ask you this, Cecilia. Is there an episode that surprised you that listeners listened to that you're like, I didn't think I would get that much of a reaction from that particular or that many listens from that? episode well it's it's really interesting because number one to to the point that kind of satya started us off with monetization has never been my goal the podcast was always a hobby it started during lockdown when i finally had kind of the time and the resources to sit down and say all right this podcast dream that i've had knocking around for a few years let's see if we can make it a reality so it was always something to do for fun, something to do with my family, something that a way to kind of stay connected when we were locked down thousands of miles apart. And then it's also been now on hiatus for a couple of years. It hasn't been an active podcast for a little while, aside from the I'm the the external or the public facing side, I say, should not had I should clarify, should not have been act is not active. Um, the research side has continued to be active and the the planning. Um, but personal matters sort of on both sides interfered with, with kind of continuing to produce and publish regular content. But the, what Marco was speaking to about sort of the not caring is sort of a magic philosophy in a way, because I'll check every few weeks or sometimes every few months and episodes will be continuing to accrue listeners, attending, continuing to accrue interest. And the first season of my podcast was a breakdown song by song of the Beach Boys album Pet Sounds, which is where the name of the podcast Pod Sounds comes from. And the fourth song, fourth track on the album, which is called Don't Talk, Put Your Head on My Shoulder, continues to get is, is like the most listened to episode to this day, I still think. And I, I have to this day not been able to really pinpoint why and put my finger on it. And I thought, are my listeners subliminally sending a message to me that I shouldn't talk? Do they want us to stop? What is the, so it, uh, but it's, it's so interesting. The amount that resonates with, or, or the, the number of people with whom I guess one particular episode would resonate for reasons of length, for reasons of the type of song being discussed. I mean, all of the songs are sort of of a piece on the one album because it is very much a, a self-contained concept album. So why should one, is it the one song that means something more to people than the others? And if so, why is that? So there could be any number of reasons, uh, none of which I've been able to definitively say, this is the one that, it, this this is the, the magic formula of this episode that has garnered it more attention than the others. So it's an ongoing, it's a puzzle. It's an ongoing adventure. Um, to, to try to decipher. I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on similar episodes in their shows. Um, if I may, I just wanna go back to Milan's question, which was um, about uh, uh, working, I think with um, monetization and so forth and mark or whatever, profitability versus the audience. And I think the one really important point for me is that you have a responsibility to your listeners, that you have a sense of trust that you're developing with them. And so that is never to be sacrificed for 
commercial means or or whatever. So for example, it given that I work uh, with authors and books, one com I could potentially work with publishing companies and get their advertisements on episodes, but I absolutely refuse to do that because then it means that those publishing companies are buying me and I will I will imperil the trust that I have developed with the guests and with the listeners who count on me to give my real opinion about what it is that I'm evaluating. So I think uh, ultimately it's that sense of trust, that relationship with your audience that must be key. Yeah, I think we, we are at a very interesting critical juncture because on the one hand, we've maintained that trust and that's like absolutely, you know, top priority for us. But at the same time, as we are growing content and we want to produce more podcasts, monetization becomes that that piece of the puzzle, right? That needs to be resolved. And how do you resolve it ethically? And how do you keep like how do you stay true to your mission and resolve it? And that's something that we've been struggling with a lot, right? It's almost like this back and forth of I don't want these advertisers, I don't want these sponsors. But then I have three more podcasts in development and how do we launch them and how do we monetize them so that immigrant identity can be seen more as a human experience than this reductive idea of, you know, immigrants being talked about in policy and politics realm. So the mission, the greater overarching mission is so important for immigrantly. And, and it's been a struggle. I, I'll be honest, it's been a struggle. And I think we 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 deal with it every single day. Um, so yeah. I wonder if now might be a time to open up to audience as well. Um, and let me just change the settings so that people can uh, unmute themselves if they want to. Um, but yeah, so do people in the audience have experiences of their own to do with monetization, to do with audience analytics, to do with kind of download numbers and listeners? Um, I know there are other active podcasters in the audience. Um, would anyone else like to weigh in on where the conversation has come to so far? If they don't, I have a question for my my colleagues on the panel, and that is, we've been talking about connecting with guests and audiences. How or in what ways do you deal with difficult guests, and what do you what do you consider a difficult guest? I'll say that uh, with. Uh... The, cha the challenges I find with guests is if they're short with their answers. And so I have some um, opening, open-ended questions that I know will facilitate a longer answer. And so I'll often start a question with, tell me about a time where you, and I'll just fill that in, or walk me through this, that, that the other. And it forces that guest to speak and take you on this journey. Um, that's the most challenging guest that I have are people who are a little bit closed or answer questions with a yes, no, and and it feels like you're pulling teeth to get them to respond. So I will immediately lean into a lot of open-ended questions that I have in my sort of toolbox. I'm just gonna correct what I said, challenging guess, not difficult, challenging. <laughs> I mean, I can add some more behind the scenes stuff. So when I'm working with uh, academics as guests, um, I, I or my producing partner will always do a preliminary phone call with them. And, you know, now I'm revealing our secrets a little bit, but hopefully none <laughs> of our future guests will, look, will listen to this. But, you know, we say it's about like discussing the topic, but it's actually also about us making sure that this guest is willing and able to speak accessibly about their research. And we have various kind of strategies for doing that, which basically are the same as what we do in the podcast episode, right? But like, you know, asking a guest to define an academic term that they've used or, 
you know, even just interrupting them to say like, wait, wait, you know, who was Dickens, right? Like a literary scholar isn't used to explaining that, but actually we want a literary scholar that doesn't get annoyed when you ask that, but is willing to give you an answer. Um, and we have sometimes just kind of quietly faded away if we've had that phone call and the guest really has like just consistently not wanted to go with us in that uh, more accessible direction. And it's not a judgment on them. It's just like, they would not be a fit. So we never come to record with someone that, um, yeah, that would really not be willing to, to communicate with us on that level. So when, when I think of challenging guests, I think I, we, we've not had many guests who are unable to engage in a conversation um, or a good conversation. Um, sometimes, yes, people do freeze um, in front of the mic. It's natural. You could have a conversation with them otherwise and they'll sound great. But then um, going back to what Linda said initially, since we don't send them questions, I want them to be organic. We, I also don't screen them in a way because I just want to be surprised as well, which is in, in some ways weird, but I do that. I don't want to know who they are and what, what to expect. But I think the challenge that I have is on the technical side because we'll send them this whole like you know guideline of what they need to do what they should wear where they should sit and then they'll come and th these are guests who have like pr teams who reach out to us and they are these are guests who should be prepared and then they'll come and they'll sit in a place where there's a lot of noise they won't have a mic they won't have headsets and then there is echo and there is noise and there's this hollow whatever and the conversation, I mean, maybe I'm very particular about that, but the conversation does not come out the way I want it to. And as a listener, I don't want to listen to a conversation that is so echoey and noisy. So I think, I don't know if it's a challenge with the guest, but I think the, they don't they don't understand the importance, and I don't blame them, they're not podcasters, <laughs> most of them are not, the importance of good sound quality. And I wish they knew that. I wish. I'll say I have not had enough guests thus far to have encountered one that I would call challenging or difficult. I wonder, having been a podcast guest myself, if I may be the challenging guest <laughs> in terms of giving, I, I, I always feel that my answers are quite long-winded and that a host will sort of give me a prompt and I'll be off and running. I don't know that that's an accurate self-perception. I don't know if it comes across that way sort of in the final the final product uh, because we all tend to hear ourselves differently than the way others hear us. Uh, but I, I wonder sometimes if I, I have a sneaking suspicion that I might need to rein it in a little bit <laughs> in a way that I don't quite have a handle on yet. Um, but it's all it's always about, I think, trying it's it's all in the service of trying to maintain a, a genuine connection with the the host, with whoever my conversation partner or partners happen to be. Um, and to again, to translate to exude that sense of intimacy and connection. So it's it's with a good heart and good intention. I'll often ask my guests if there's anything that they would like me to mention on the podcast they have a book, if they have something coming up. And if I find I'm stuck for whatever reason, the guest is proving to be a challenge. I just don't know where else to go. I'm kind of lost in my thoughts. I will go to what they want me to talk about because that's usually a great jumping off point. So like, well, you know what? I want to talk about your book. And that is one, one thing. And uh, immediately the guest is engaged. They're able to speak on it. Where did you come with the title? Whatever, whatever thought comes to me or if I prepared questions with regards to that particular thing is often uh, a great jumping off point for my, to get things back on track. Kim. Hi, I have a question. Um, uh, and it's for Sadia, but also for everyone else. Sadia, you mentioned that um, you tell your guests what to wear. Um, do you record video? Uh, yeah, I, I meant not like wear as in clothes. Sorry, oh. I meant like a mic or. Where to be? Yeah, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> anyone, I know. I, does anyone record uh, video? I, 
Um, I do record video though, and I'm not okay. that no, so, I so can you tell us about that? Because um, it's something we've been thinking about because we have an intern who like wants us to make TikTok videos, which I think is a little silly. But um, uh, so we're curious, like, what's it like to um, have an interview with a guest where you are recording video? Are they camera shy? Is there like, and how do you feel as a host knowing that your face is being recorded? What is that? What is that like? Yeah, so we ask their permission. Obviously, we tell them that this will be recorded and we will post, you know, reels on YouTube, like in form of shorts and then Instagram and TikTok. And most of them are fine. Uh, what we're finding is that YouTube has become this, you know, new platform that really drives traffic to streaming platforms. And what is surprising to me is people on YouTube are a lot more interactive with our content than on other platforms. So I will see a lot of comments on YouTube on our reels and our content versus somewhere else. And I don't know if that's happening to other creators as well. Um, so I feel like our goal now is to create more presence on YouTube. And I, I, I come from Pakistan. I grew up there. Um, in places like India and Pakistan, I see a lot of people are really watching podcasts, which is, again, something that people don't think about. It's like all podcasts are on YouTube and they interact with podcasts with, through video as well. Um, so, yeah, our goal is to be more interactive. And for me as well as a guest, um, or as a host, if I can see my guest, it's somehow just you know gives me um, more almost insights into what they're thinking if they are comfortable not comfortable do I need to pivot do I need to slow down um yeah it just makes it more comfortable for me if I can really see my hosts my guests sorry yeah what do the rest of you think like pros and cons of video whether it's like just behind the scenes when you're recording the conversation and or also making some of that video public. So uh, initially I started using, Marco, you can go ahead and share with me. Um, very quickly, I'll just say initially I started using Zencaster um, and that gives you the option of recording audio and video and I would never record the video especially because I was trying to make my guests feel at ease and to let them know it, it doesn't matter what you look like, it's only your voice that we we need for the purposes of the podcast. That said, I know what Sadia is saying, that YouTube is increasingly becoming a way of driving traffic. It's something, it's a tool I've not used a lot. Um, and so it's something that I, I personally have to rethink now. I don't know. I just use audio. I don't use video for my podcast. Rather, my podcast hosting platform allows me to uh, take my my podcast and make it to a YouTube video, which just has my my podcast artwork or logo and like a graph going that way. It, it's just because my personal preference, I don't have the time to do both a podcast and to, to edit a video. So that just doesn't work for me as a podcaster. Uh, I wish it did because I know the importance of it. But at this moment, I'm not doing that. I also have, again, limited experience with video recording or, or involvement in any way from the podcast perspective. I am intrigued by the idea. First of all, I also engage with podcasts on YouTube, some that have actual video that has been recorded and some, as Marco just described, uh, with sort of just the, the logo and the little sound waves going. Um, because that's just, it's just as engaging for me in a way. And I love YouTube as a platform. I think it's a really, a really wonderful resource and one that is extremely popular and that reaches uh, a really diverse usership uh, all over the world. I am intrigued by the idea of TikTok kind of becoming a podcast aid or a podcast companion because some of my favorite podcasters do post clips of the recording process on their TikToks, and then they'll post those TikToks in turn to YouTube because they'll reach more people that way. So I have thought, particularly because as I've said, all of my collaborators thus far have not been on the same continent as I am, that maybe we make these little short form kind of glimpses into the recording process from each of our ends or from one end or the other, and then release that 
on TikTok, on YouTube, sort of put it out there as a companion piece to here are the faces behind the scenes. Here is sort of the the a, a look into the environment or or just what's going on behind the curtain. Um, and so I think that the idea of lis listen to the intern about TikTok, because I think that might be a, a really fascinating way to go. Yeah, and adding to Cecilia's point, I think short form is something that we are experimenting with a lot. And I, I will say this, I want to preface it with, we do have a small team, right? So it's not just me, one person. It's like, we have a small team. We have a team that focuses only on social media and YouTube. So that helps because they can create these reels and then we post them. And then every you, you on YouTube, you can really upload your, um, you, uh, your RSS feed as well. What Marco and Cecilia are saying, you can listen to it that way. But if you want people to see who you are, um, you can do reels short form. We are thinking of doing long form as well. So the entire episode, right? Just seeing what, how that resonates with folks, because especially for immigrantly, the podcast itself, it has really deep conversations and sometimes just posting short form doesn't really capture the essence of that conversation. But then we have Banterly, which is Gen Z focused, Gen Z podcast by Gen Zers. We post it on TikTok, we post it on YouTube, people like it, they listen to it because it's very different cadence versus say Sportly, which is our sports podcast. Um, so I think it also depends on the kind of content that you're producing, the audience that you're targeting, where that audience is found more, um, and what do you expect? Because as I said, for us, for Immigrantly, I think long form video will be better than short form that we've been doing on um, YouTube and TikTok. Thank you. So any other questions or reactions from people in the audience? I'm also just wondering, you know, with video, certainly an excerpt, it doesn't pose that many difficulties for the podcast episode, but if you're trying to create a sort of video that is identical to the, the audio of the podcast, doesn't that make the, the edit much harder, right? Because you can like cut audio within it within a podcast that then would look really strange. Like the cuts would be very visible in the video. Like I think it it raises some very different questions when you're thinking about long form video podcasts, right? So, so yeah, I mean, if we are to think of how do we match it with audio, right? So we have to be very consistent in what is on audio and then what do we post on video? Um, and again, it requires more time, uh, more resources, more energy. But again, I feel like since our content is really more like, in, in some ways, it's very universal, right? Because it really revolves around immigrant identity, which transcends boundaries. So I feel like um, video form and YouTube becomes really important for us and how we want to interact with people, say, who are living in countries where they're thinking about what really immigrant identity in the US looks like. Um, so I think, again, th there's so many questions one has to answer. Does it warrant enough time and energy? Does your content really, um, should your content be on YouTube? Because maybe you have enough listeners on audio and you don't want, and people that you know listen to your content may not even be on YouTube or may not be interested. So again, it goes back to knowing your audience, where they are, um, and what your goals are from a podcast or multiple podcasts. Yeah, we have a comment in the chat from Luth um, about Descript, which I used years ago when it was just audio, but apparently I was hearing this the other day that it now does video as well. Does anyone use Descript or want to speak to speak to it, how it works? So Josh in the chat is saying it's rolling out video regenerate, which helps with cut, cutting out filler words without the video having an unnatural cut. So, I mean, that seems to me on the one hand, amazing in terms of like time saving, energy saving, but also a little dystopian, right? We're starting to get into videos that are not actually the conversation that was had, but something edited, but invisibly so. Um, but yeah, Luth, do you want to speak to this? You've, you've been using this? 
Oh, did, did you ask me or did you ask somebody else? So Luth Martinez in the chat. Um, yeah. I'm not sure you should be able to unmute. Is that working? Sorry, I really struggled there. Yes. You can Amazing. also turn video on if you want or not. Up to oh, you. my God. You do not want to see me right now. Um, <laughs> that is there not a thing you want, to, you want to observe. Pros uh, and cons it's... of video use. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I was not ready for that part. But um, what I will say is I really struggled editing my videos, like even for short form content. content I don't use any um, non-real generated other word, otherwise AI content, but it's my own recordings and I just upload them to Descript. You highlight the part you want to eliminate and then it way more seamlessly than I can ever do through hours and hours of video editing on Premiere does it like in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat, the audio and the video matches and you'll decide, oh, that looks normal enough or no, that looks awkward, but 90% of the time it looks normal enough for me. So yeah, really, really easy. Just upload, highlight, delete what you don't want it to play. And then you could download it as video. You could download it as MP4 or whatever you're going to use. And so easy. You can repurpose. You can make little clips on there um, for your memes, your TikTok, your whatever you're going to do. And there is AI help, obviously, but it's all my own content. So I'm not using anything that's not naturally sourced. Yeah, fascinating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, super Script easy. Script is something that has, I've always sort of kept one eye on it. And every time I look back, it looks more terrifying and more multifaceted. Um, and it isn't, it isn't a tool that I would really sit down with until the next time I were to really want to put together an episode. But knowing that it kind of has all of that functionality integrated, is really wonderful. So I appreciate the the inside look. Another thing that Descript has been able to do, I remember discussing it at this symposium a year ago, probably even two years ago now, is like an AI voice doppelganger. So like if you feed it enough of your own voice in audio, it can then um, speak in your voice and you can go into the written text script add in words, like if you misspoke and you want to change a word, you add it in. And then like just that word, the AI will speak and it will sound like you. And you can even make it speak in your voice, but speak other languages that you do not speak. Like it really is kind of, um, yeah, mind boggling what it can do. Yeah, so we did that with one of our podcasts this year, which was for elections. Um, it was limited series. It ended recently after the elections. Uh, and we worked with this other company um, to create an AI generated Spanish version of it, of course, with um, consent from hosts, production team, giving a disclaimer in the beginning, because we are very intentional about that, that this is AI generated. I kid you not. We launched Spanish version um, because again, thinking of immigrant identity, we do want to produce content in addition to English and other languages as well. And if you listen to that, it's called, um, so the, the English version is called Nationly and then the, the Spanish version is called Nationly and Espanol. And if you listen to it, it's really our hosts speaking in Spanish, but it's not them, like it's like, obviously with their consent and it's it's mind boggling. So for me, What's fascinating in podcasting space is how technology can be used for good as well, obviously with intentionality, with disclaimers, with honesty. When I think of our podcast, I'm like, I would love all of our content to be released in multiple languages that I speak and other people in all over the world speak, right? Why not? Um, so that's fascinating. And we've already done that with one podcast and the goal is to do it with multiple podcasts but it's expensive <laughs> and it goes back to, you know, resources and monetization, but that's something that we've done. Something else that we've done when it comes to AI is having interactive transcriptions. So again, working with another startup that does transcriptions, but then they are interactive. So as you're listening to the podcast episode, you're reading the transcript and you can really 
interact with the the text the transcript in real time so you can comment on it ask questions say oh you know why is this happening um we did that with Bantili for a couple of episodes with again a startup and it was fascinating so i'm really fascinated by how technology is going to change the podcasting experience in the next few years Well, on that optimistic note, um, I think we should end this panel. Um, and so we will be back again at, I think, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Um, the fact that you're all here means you've all found the links that you need for that. And um, yeah, I want to thank all of our panelists for this wonderful discussion. Um, you've given me many ideas and I'm sure many people in the audience. Um, so thank you all so much, um, a round of applause, and uh, then see you at the next session. Thank you, Milan, for hosting it. Thank you so yes. much. Yes, thank you, Milan. Thank, <laughs> thank, you, thank you all, I've learned so much from you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>